Hi, this is the Step Fader Mark II from Tesseract Modular. It's a dual eight step sequencer with a quantizer and a lot of cool features built in. I've been playing around with this pre-production model now for a few weeks because Tesseract supplied it to me so I could make this video. So in this video, I'm gonna explain how the Step Fader Mark II works, give you some patch examples and tips and tricks that you can use it in your patch. While Tesseract provided me this module, they haven't paid me for it, they've no say in the video, but they've been very helpful answering all of my crazy questions and taking some of my suggestions. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. I'll do my best to answer all of them. And with that, let's get started. Let's do a quick tour of the module so you can understand the inputs and the outputs and how you can use it. So the step fader is broken up into two parallel eight step sequencers. Now they can be combined into one 16 step sequencer or you can run them in parallel with different clock divisions or you can run them on the same clock division. Each sequencer has eight faders and the faders are what let you set the CV value per step. The master fader here, M1 and M2, allow you to uh, attenuate the range of voltages being generated by the steps. So the maximum voltage you can output is 10 volts. So at the max here, it goes up to 10 volts and you can scale it back. In addition to the faders, we have these rows of buttons here. These serve double duty. They're both function control buttons by using these shift and function knobs, but they also allow you to individually enable and disable gates. So while the sequencer is playing, if it hits a certain uh, step in the sequence and that gate is disabled, it will not generate a CV value there and you won't get a gate out. We've got these four knobs here and these are used to uh, attenuate the inputs coming from the CV input here. The clock and the reset behave like you would expect them to do. You can clock the sequencers independently or clock one is normal to clock two. It also has an internal clock. If you do shift to play, you can actually play it without having to have an external clock. So this could act as a master clock for your system because the clocks are output here in addition to gates and triggers. You can feed in an external signal to be quantized to the quantizer using the QIN1 and QIN2 inputs here. This takes an external signal in and then routes it through the internal quantizer before sending it out the outputs. You have two outputs per sequencer, volt per octave one and slew one, volt octave two and slew two. The volt per octave is the straight output from the quantizer. So the values from the CV uh, range here mapped through this are sent into the scale quantizer and then come out the volt per octave one. You're typically going to patch that into your oscillator. Slew one and slew two are the outputs of a slew limiter that's put after the volt per octave one output. So this is normaled into here, and that will allow you to slide or slew between the uh, voltage ranges. Now I should distinguish between slides and slewing because there is a slide mode as well, which allow you to do those 303 slide style uh, jumps between values. This is a strict slew limiter, so it's gonna slowly bring the voltage up from one level to another. Now let's look at how we actually read this menu here. There's two buttons, the shift and the function button. The function button gives you access to the gold printed text and the shift button gives you access to some of the white printed text here. So for example, shift play will start the sequencer playing and you see the sequencer on top sequencer one is running at a different clock rate from the bottom sequencer two because I've clock division set differently. When you're in this mode, the CV values uh, from these knobs can be mapped to internal parameters. So for example, CV1 is by default here mapped to the length of sequencer one. So you notice now we're only going through the first five steps. If I turn it all the way here to the left, we're doing four, and now we're just on one. And if I go all the way up here, we're back to eight steps. Similarly, CV2 is mapped to the clock divider for sequencer two. So I can turn it there and you see sequencer two is now getting faster and faster. And if I have it all the way here, counterclockwise, sequencer two is now running at the same speed as sequencer one. These CV mappings can be remapped to anything you want and I'll show you how to do that in just a second. The main mode you wanna find yourself in is gate trigger mode. So just go funct GT here and you're in gate and trigger mode. Gate and trigger mode allows you to enable or selectively disable gates on different outputs. Let's actually watch what this does to the output. So I'm going to use one of these uh, wonderful like illuminated halo uh, cables that I got from uh, my volts. I'm just going to patch that into there and you'll see 
that one is glowing blue. And I'll patch this one here into the Volproct of 2 output. And now you can see that the value is changing as the curve changes of the voltages being generated. It gets brighter and darker. The mode lets us change the playback mode. So by default, it's in the standard forward mode that you would expect of any sequencer. I can go function mode, and I'll just go shift and play to stop playback. Because the way this works is you change the mode by pressing the buttons. So say I want to change the bottom sequencer to play in reverse mode, and I want the top sequencer to play in random mode. So one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to choose random mode there. Look at on the bottom sequencer now how the uh, playhead is moving backwards sequentially. And on the top sequencer, the playhead is randomly jumping around as we choose different steps. So if you wanted to have uh, a random modulation source or a ramp up or ramp down, this would be one way of doing it. I can change the play mode as we're playing by going back to normal here and then go function GT and I'm back to my starting state. There's a quantizer built in, as I mentioned, so go function scale, and this now gives you a keyboard view. These are the white notes, here's the two and three black notes that you can program in your own scales. Now, there's one quantizer shared between both of the sequencers, so you can't have different scales per sequencer. So say, you know, we want to just enable all the black notes and turn off and just like the, uh, what's that, F note between the two of them, perhaps. That's how you would do it there. Again, function GT to exit out of that mode, and we're back into our standard play mode. Now I've patched up a fairly simple patch here. I've got a clock coming out of PAMS going into the clock of sequencer 1, which will also clock sequencer 2. I've got the uh, output of the, uh, the steps going into the pitch input here using this uh, halo cable. The output of the uh, oscillator goes into uh, the filter agent and into my mixer. I'm also sending the same trigger into both the trigger input here because the, the Mana Sideratus has its own built-in envelope generator, but I also want to send an envelope into the filter just to ping the filter. So you can, you'll be able to see that uh, trigger coming out of the sequencer trigger the envelope here as well as flashing this light. So let's just hit play. So not exactly a very exciting sequence. But as you hear when I move the sliders, there's the master slider increasing the voltage range. So I tend to keep it down around here so things stay musical. Now let's play around with the CV control of the length of the sequencer. So if I have my CV up here, it's a full eight step sequence. If I turn CV1 down, I can adjust the length of the sequence. But how do you actually do that? Let's look at the CV mapping mode. If I press function and CV in one, that allows me to control which of these gold uh, parameters here, the CV1 input is mapped to. Now, you can't map it to all of them, but pretty much all of them. The top row corresponds to sequencer 1, and the bottom row corresponds to sequencer 2. So it's these middle controls here that you can remap. So, for example, if I wanted to map CV1 to be the clock division of sequencer 1, I would press this button here. Why? Because div stands for clock division. That would map CV1 onto clock division for sequencer 1, and that would map it onto clock division for sequencer 2. Now let's go back here and see what effect that change has made. Now all of a sudden see how slow the sequencer is running. If I turn down CV1, we're running at full speed, and then the clock division increases and the sequencer slows down. How can I see what value is being modulated on a parameter? Well, the parameter I'm modulating in this case, I've just changed it to be div, clock division. So press function div. Now, the rows are fully illuminated, which shows the amount of clock division is to its maximum. But watch what happens when I turn the CV1 knob. Look at that. The number of illuminated LEDs on top reduces. I'm reducing the amount of modulation being applied to the clock divider. We can also put that under external CV control. So let's take a, just a bipolar LFO coming in here. And now watch as this LFO changes value. I'll just speed it up. You can see the modulation being applied in real time. 
Say I want to go back and map CV1 to be the start of sequencer 1 and CV2 to be the length of sequencer 1. So I want to be able to control which of the notes I'm playing so I can slide a window around on the sequencer. Press function CV in 1 and this time I'm going to map it to the start position. And for that we go to start and I'm going to choose sequencer 1. I'm going to press function CV in 2. Now look at how CVN2 is already mapped to the clock divider, it's on div, for sequencer 2. Remember I showed you that earlier? We're going to change that now to be the size, so go to size of sequencer 1 and press the button. Now we can actually see again the modulation happening in real time. So look at how the start position changes now on sequencer 1 when I turn the knob. The brightly illuminated pad is the current playhead. If I can go shift reset they go back to the start and of course the start is not the first pad because I have just changed where the start position is. I'm going to change the start position to be this step here. Now when I do shift reset look at how the playhead jumps to the new start position. Let's send the clock in. Now I'm changing the playhead all the way back to the beginning again. And I move to the end. Now let's look at using these sequencers as a source of modulation. After all, they're just generating CV values, so we can send that modulation into interesting places in our patch. So we're going to modulate some of the parameters over here on the Manus Iteratus, and we'll just open up the filter. Now what I've done is I've just patched the output of sequencer 2 here, into the smash input on the Manus Iteratus. I've also set the clock divider to be slightly uh, lower on sequencer 2, so it moves faster, and I programmed in a sequence here. And now we're going to hear some rhythmic modulation on Manus. You'll see here the color changing as the different voltages are being generated. And of course, I could change the clock divider to be even faster. And if I wanted those to jump around randomly, I could go to function mode and set that to be random. And now I'm sending random modulation amounts into the smash parameter here. Now, I mentioned a couple of things like transposing and slides earlier on in the video, so I want to show you how exactly that works. Let's look at slide mode first of all. Slide creates a kind of a gentle slide between individual steps when it's active. How do you turn it on? Let's go function and slide. And right now, no uh, step is illuminated because you activate slide per step. So let's just say we're going to activate slide on the last four steps of sequencer one, and we're going to keep the first four steps with no slide, so the notes will play just note, note, note. Go back into function gate and trigger mode, and if we hit play, now you hear there, because we're playing on the first four notes, no slide. Now if I adjust the start head, and now we're on the last four notes, you hear the slide? Just a little bit of a slide between the notes. Now let's look at transposition. You can transpose each sequencer by going function transpose. Right now none of the LEDs are illuminated and you can transpose per sequencer either down by semitones or up by semitones. Now the manual shows how to actually interpret these buttons. Basically these add together or subtract to create different values that you may want to add or subtract from the melody being generated. Transposition is applied before the quantizer. So if you have a quantizer turned on in a scale that has a lot of notes removed, don't be surprised if after you transpose you don't hear any change, because after all the quantizer is going to re-quantize that back to whatever you've mapped on your scale. Now let's turn on our sequencer again and let's experiment with quantizing. I'm going to quantize up a semitone and all the way up to an octave.
if we can transpose manually using these uh, controls here, surely we can do it under CV control? And the answer is yes. This is where you can use Sequencer 2 to transpose Sequencer 1 up and down. So you can build progressions by setting the clock divider quite slow on the bottom sequencer and then patching that into Sequencer 1. I'm going to show you how to do that now. To set up a transposition using Sequencer 2, we take the output of the CV1 plus 2 output, route that back into the QIN1 input here on Sequencer 1. What that does is it takes the sum of the two values from the sequencer, so this is our melody and this is our transposition offset, adds them together, and this patch cable sends it back into the quantizer to requantize back into the scale to go back out here into our oscillator. Now I've reset the playheads back to the start position, so let's see what happens. First of all, I'll turn all of these off so we have no transposition going on. Okay, we now know what that sounds like. Let's add some random transposition here, and I'll just turn this slider up about midway. As you can see, it's getting transposed, but of course that's just way too fast. We're transposing in the middle of like notes being played. So I'm gonna set the clock divider very slow on sequencer two. The last thing I want to show you is how to use the step fader as a 16 step sequencer. To do this, we press function and main, and the mode we're going to select is single. Now, this disables the concept of a second sequencer, and both of these now become one 16 step sequencer. So, if you go back to function and gate trigger mode here, you see I've got the first eight steps turned on. And then I've selectively enabled a few steps here on the second sequencer with a few notes in there. Again, we have to take the output of the CV1 plus 2 input, route that into the quantizer input on QN1, and then take the output of that quantizer into our pitch information for our envelope. So you see here how the playhead's now moving across both of the sequencers, and across if I change the length of the sequencer, now we're going from 1 to 16. There's quite a few other things that we could cover here, some small details, for example. You can load and save presets by pressing function load and save. You have 16 slots that you can load and save into. There's also a keyboard mode if you press function key where you can press and play the pads as if they're a keyboard. Hope you enjoyed today's video. By all means, leave me some questions or comments down below. I do try to answer all of them if I can. And thanks very much for watching.